Hello and welcome to this video on yeast flocculation. Flocculation is a key process in fermentation for yeast. Flocculation is the means by which yeast settles to the bottom of the fermenter at the end of the process. It primarily applies to top fermenting strains like ale yeast. However, bottom fermenting yeasts such as that used in lager do have relevance when it comes to flocculation. Near the end of fermentation, single yeast cells aggregate into clumps of thousands of cells. These fall to the bottom of the fermenter. If yeast flocculates too early, the brew becomes under attenuated and contains an amount of sugar that could have and most often should have been fermented. Flocculant cells are cells that appear to be covered in small hairs or spines. These filaments when seen under a scanning electron microscope are quite interesting. These cells also have a negative surface charge. This negative electron charge causes repulsion between cells when they come near to each other. When they do collide, normally under specific environmental conditions, they overcome this repulsion of the dual negative charges and then they proceed to stick together. This allows them to aggregate and sink to the bottom. It is the how and why of this that is important. At physiological or normal yeast pH values, the yeast cell wall has a net negative charge. This is largely due to the charge of the carboxyl and phosphodiester groups of the cell wall proteins. These create most of the gateways and portals through the cell wall for sugar and other important compounds to pass through. In the case of cerevisiae yeast cell lines, the cell wall is made of an inner layer composed of glucan and chitin and a fibrillar outer layer. This is made primarily by alpha-mannan, which is a glycosylated form of sugar associated with proteins. As with magnets, the dual charges of two poles that are the same will prevent the two ends of the magnet from binding to each other. This is the same thing that occurs in cell walls when they approach. This is a barrier to effective cell aggregation, and as a result, cells tend to remain dispersed and in suspension when fermenting. There are a number of theories as to why the differing cell types bind and overcome this particular repulsion between themselves. One of the most well established and understood is that there is a specific lectin-like protein that is only present on flocculating cells when they are flocculating, and that it recognizes and interacts with the different types of residues on other yeast cell surfaces. This enables the specific form of binding necessary for flocculation. It is only possible when in the presence of calcium ions that act as a cofactor for this particular lectin binding system. As a general rule, flocculation is a reversible process. Yeast taken from one particular fermentation can be transplanted to another, wherein they will disperse and begin fermenting again without flocculating until the process reaches its conclusion. This is useful when trying to either repitch, restart, or recover yeast from one particularly well done or desirable product. As a general rule, yeast specialists and manufacturers describe their yeast into a number of categories. With regards to flocculation, this is generally describing their behaviour as being either a high, medium or low flocculating species. The high flocculation types tend to start to flocculate at the very earliest stage possible, and this can leave behind some of the unfermented sugars and this can create unwanted flavour compounds or a very sweet brew. One of the more well-established undesired compounds is diacetyl groups. Medium flocculation is one of the more common kinds of yeast used. This is primarily due to its balance between early dropout and the amount of sugar that is fermented. As a consequence of this balance, very little sugar remains, but the yeast falls out of suspension very quickly. This creates a high turnaround time for production lines. The final kind is low flocculation strains, and these stay in suspension well after fermentation has ended. These tend to be used for very specific production lines, and this is generally wheat beer strains, due to the nature of the product and the desired flavours. Based on what has been stated so far, there must be a clear reason for the use of either different kinds of flocculating yeast, or for a way to use a yeast strain that although unsuitable in its own state, may be worked or used as a tool more effectively and efficiently for brewing. Factors that are involved with this include calcium, pH, ethanol, and more. Some of these will now be covered. Calcium is a major influencing factor when it comes to flocculation. 
more specifically, in the earlier described pathways and mechanisms for binding of yeast cells. Earlier researchers found that calcium chloride at a rate of approximately 0.1 millimoles a litre was necessary to produce flocculation, and that it was not influenced by the time of the culture, provided it was at least three days old, though it did note that top fermenting yeast strains flocculated without any calcium added to them, as distinct from bottom fermenting yeast strains. Next is pH. Stationary cells flocculate only in a very narrow pH range, and this is from 3 to 4.5 for top strains, and from 3.5 to 6 for bottom strains. The importance of this is that most fermenting tanks tend to stand still, and as a result, the cells will remain stationary. In an industrial setting, there is a degree of agitation over time, and as a result, this time and the pH requirements may decrease, but for the home brewer, it is worth noting the pH requirements. For the home brewer, and particularly for the adventurous home brewer, is the influence of ethanol. Cells have an exponential growth phase, and do not flocculate during this. They do, however, produce ethanol. Adding yeast during this stage, or adding ethanol during this stage, does not initiate flocculation as would be expected if ethanol was the primary factor driving it, and for stationary cells, this is no different from one strain to the next. Flocculation of bottom fermenting strains is not influenced by ethanol, regardless of how much calcium is added to the wash. However, top fermenting strains induce flocculation at 5% ethanol by volume when no calcium is added, when calcium is added, this rate is even lower again, and as a consequence it is worth noting that if you are trying to brew either a high alcohol concentration beer, a spirit wash, or something similar, the use of either a top or bottom fermenting yeast strain is important as a driving factor in both the selection and the result. As can be imagined, ethanol drives pH down as a result of it being slightly acidic. This means that there is a combined effect of both ethanol and pH in the environment. When adding ethanol, the pH range in which flocculation occurs will broaden, and when no calcium chloride is added, the pH profiles of 0 and 5% alcohol by volume were the same as at 5 to 10% alcohol by volume. The pH in which flocculation occurs included that of the culture medium when it has not been changed. This pointed to the requirement of a certain concentration of ethanol for flocculation of particularly top fermenting strains to occur during fermentation. Bottom fermenting strains are established to require not only a certain degree of pH change, but calcium chloride, whereas the discussed top fermenting requires a pH change and ethanol in order to flocculate properly. Clearly, calcium chloride has a significant part to play in this but there are other ions that influence the effect. When pH is adjusted with hydrogen chloride, both calcium chloride and magnesium chloride induce flocculation. This ranges between 0.5 and 1 millimole a litre. It was observed that when mixing both magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, that 100 millimoles of magnesium chloride would result in the flocculation to be disrupted and reversed to a certain degree and in order to avoid flocculation in ethanol, the absence of salts was essential. Flocculation could be provoked by the addition of 1 millimole of calcium chloride or 10 millimoles of magnesium chloride. However, adding sodium chloride, table salt, at 200 millimoles did nothing. As a result, there is clearly a range in which it works well. In the case of magnesium chloride, this is clearly below 100 millimoles that anything above this has a substantial negative impact upon the fermentation process and then flocculation. As a result, it's worth noting that if ethanol has one effect, then there are possibly different other organic solvents that would have another effect. And this was looked at with particularly aliphatic alcohols. These increased flocculation in the following order, methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol particularly. Isopropanol is not effective, and this then created a hierarchy in which alcohols were effective at creating flocculation. It was noticed by other researchers that glycerol functions had little to no effect 
on flocculation. However, propylene glycol was effective, and it was almost as effective as methanol. When looking at the range of possible products of fermentation, the ones that have the most effect, bar ethanol, are the ones that are least desirable. This was noticed in the effect of acetone, which was comparable in its efficacy to that of methanol. Therefore, to get the greatest possible degree of flocculation, a certain amount of runoff is required, and a certain amount of sacrifice may be required, if the wrong yeast strain is selected for the role. As a consequence, as stated already, selection of an appropriate yeast strain is an important factor when considering for flocculation. The next factor to consider when looking at fermentation and flocculation in combination is the influence of sugar. The addition of up to 500 millimoles of glucose, mannose, or mannose derivatives does not affect flocculation of top fermenting strains. And for bottom fermenting strains, inhibition of flocculation occurs after the addition of between 50 and 500 millimoles of mannose, maltose, glucose, and mannose derivatives. This is confirmed in results published by Massey et al. Further work by other researchers has found that particular compounds had a greater effect on bottom fermenting strains, and particularly bottom fermenting strains that flocculated were inhibited by the use of certain sugars, but that these had no effect on top fermenting strains and did not affect their flocculation. Given that sugar has such a substantial impact upon the ability of bottom fermenting strains to flocculate, it is understandable that the culture medium composition may have an effect upon the ability of the yeast strain to flocculate properly. The general finding of most research has been that after a number of days, yeast in suspension will flocculate, and that when resuspended in fresh medium, they will deflocculate. Stationary cells, when either exposed to new media or agitated mildly by the addition of new cells, will only flocculate to a minor degree. This partial flocculation is important to note in that it is indication of a beginning process. As a result, adding yeast strains that have been cultured in a still media will result in problems in a primary fermentation. The general limitation on culturing new yeast strains in a still media was three days of culturing. Beyond these very specific circumstances, there are a number of more general environmental factors that influence yeast flocculation including the fermentation temperature, where particularly low temperatures initiate flocculation more so than your average temperature, and that pushing the temperature higher will also cause the same problems. The original gravity, the amount of oxygen, the amount of sugar, and particularly those that inhibit flocculation, an increase of fermentation byproducts, factors that increase the chances of yeast cells colliding, the pitching rate, yeast age, Factors that decrease the cell surface charge. This relates primarily to the pH. Changes in the cell wall composition. And particularly the expression and incorporation of genetically initiated flocculins. These being the binding factors. And finally, a very specific factor for production of beer. Where premature yeast flocculation inducing factors can be a byproduct of fermenting barley husks. An understanding of all of these points will help considerably in both delaying flocculation and then initiating it at the correct time. This will lead to better yields and quality of home brew. Thank you for watching. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions you may have below.